Welcome to the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Now, here's your host, editor Christian Berg. All right, welcome back to the Bow Hunting Podcast. Uh, all bow hunting, all the time. It's an exciting time of year. If you're a deer hunter, whitetail seasons are open just about everywhere. And I think this week's topic is going to be of interest to just about everyone, because if there's one thing that I am sure of as a whitetail hunter, and I think that all, there's not much you could get every whitetail hunter to agree on, but I think I could get every whitetail hunter to agree that if we could pick the right and best days and times to be out there to maximize our efficiency with the limited time we have in the field, everyone would be on board for that. And to that end, I've got a guest who's no stranger to the deer hunting community. It's Mr. Brian Murphy. He's with Hunt Stand now. Uh, some of you may remember him from his long tenure with the Quality Deer Management Association. And of course, a lifelong avid whitetail hunter and bow hunter himself. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Oh, great to be with you, Christian. Well, man, it's been a while since we since we've talked, but I am excited uh, for what we're going to discuss today, because uh, would you be on board with me there, Brian? I mean, you know, even those of us who have worked in the industry, let's face it, there's always family commitments. There's always work commitments, uh, other things that come up. We can't just sit in a tree from dawn to dark six weeks straight every fall and you know, trying to figure out, I mean, yeah, there's some things we generally know, you know, first week in November is going to be a heck of a lot better than the first week of October. But when it comes to getting really granular and, and finding, you know, the right days and times to be out there, it's, it's not an exact science. And uh, there's definitely some art that mixes with the science to figure it all that out. No doubt, Christian. And, you know, and you, you mentioned, uh, first week of November is better than the first week of October. And really that depends on where you are in the whitetails range. And we'll talk a little bit about that today with some of the new tools that we uh, have developed at hunt stand that I'm very excited to share with your, your audience today. And, and you're right. I mean, we have a limited amount of time to hunt. We want to be as efficient with our time and as successful a field as we can. And, you know, of course, many hunters, uh, you know, do their, their, their extra homework, if you will, and determine when the peak of the rut is for their area or, you know, when the heavy pre-rut period is or the second rut, or they look at all the weather variables and, and, and other factors and try to determine when even during that window to hunt. And, and what we've tried to do at Hunt Stand is, is really to allow science and data to gather to, to guide our decisions and make us even more efficient with our time. And, you know, as a, as a you know, career deer biologist, uh, you know, working on some of these new features that we're going to talk about today has really been an exciting opportunity for me. It's, uh, a year's worth of work over the last uh, year to develop a couple of these new tools that we'll talk about. And uh, I think, I think hunters are just going to eat them up. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm giddy about them and heck I'm a deer geek. It's all I, I do is, is read about whitetails and study them and have my entire career. So, you know, if I'm giddy, I, hopefully I can share that, uh, that same giddiness with the other hunters. Absolutely. And I am excited to look at this too. You know, it's funny because I just got access yesterday to start poking around some of this. And so I'm looking forward to diving in, but before we really dive into the big news, which is this new pro whitetail tier that Hunt Stand is offering, which is literally brand new for you know this fall for this hunting season, you can be the first kid on your block to take advantage of this information and put it to use for you and your deer hunting. I want to take a quick step back, Brian, because. You know, there's always a couple people who have been under that rock and they might not even know what hunt stand is, which is hard to believe. But I think, you know, most people have at least heard of it. If you don't have the hunt stand app, you need to just put that on your phone. It doesn't cost you anything to download. And there are a bunch of features, you know, that you can take advantage of without a paid subscription. And, you know, the one that I think probably helped hunt stand to get its real foothold in the deer hunting community way back when. And I don't know, Brian, you know, maybe you do. How long Hunt Stand's been around? It seems like it's been forever now in my mind, but it's probably only been, you know, six or eight years or whatever. But the Hunt Zone, 
is the big one that that really drew me to hunt stand and, and originally and that's where you can literally tap on the location of any one of your stands or blinds or anywhere that you want to go to hunt or you want to check your entry and exit routes and and that won't just show you the wind direction it actually will draw a circle around that location and it'll show you which piece of the pie your scent cone is blowing and i mean i just use that all the time it's a super helpful tool and of course you guys have added a lot of other things over the years to hunt stand and so again if you're a serious deer hunter and you have never checked this out just the hunt zone alone to me you know i like it it's got that 72 hour wind forecast and you can take your finger and you can slide the bar you know okay it's this is where it's blowing now but you know here okay we're we're talking here on a thursday afternoon i might want to see what it's doing friday morning or friday afternoon because today's a rainy day here in pennsylvania not really a great day to hunt it's a little windy kind of miserable out there but tomorrow after this front blows through and again, we'll get into this. Your pro whitetail says tomorrow might be a, a halfway decent day. So here I'm thinking about hunting tomorrow, maybe tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon. So I'm using that hunt zone to see, you know, where things are, are, are going to be good for my stands. So lots of stuff there, Brian. And with that as the stage setter, you know, talk to me about what you've been doing. And, and I, you said a year, uh, my buddy Tim, who helped set up this interview, he said you've been working on this day and night literally for a long time what kind of data have you been crunching for this pro whitetail tier and this whitetail forecast that you guys have put together and and how can you know all the people who are listening or watching this podcast use it to be more successful deer hunters absolutely well, well let me back up just a little bit you mentioned kind of the, the origin of hunt stand and i'll just speak briefly that the company started 12 years ago by an avid hunter in Columbia, South Carolina, Lanford Holloway, who literally was sitting in an MBA class and was asked to do a project. And he was an avid hunter of a, a local hunting club and thought technology could really help solve a lot of the problems they had with coordination of hunts and property boundary lines and that sort of thing. And so that was kind of the ori original sort of impetus for Hunt Stand. And of course, we've added a, a number, of, just an incredible number of features and, and, uh, and benefits since then. Uh, the, the hunt zone is, is obviously a, an incredible tool. And, and in fact, I use it pretty much daily when I hunt, just like you. And, and I hunt the same couple of farms mostly. And I would think that after 20 years that I would know exactly the direction every stand is facing. And therefore, if we have a northwest wind or a southeast wind, I would know exactly what stands and, and how that wind would be blowing. And I have been continually shocked at how wrong I have been often. Uh, I'm hangar day close most of the time, but even if you're 30 degrees off, if that wind's not just right for certain entry and exit of certain deer that you're after, it can really blow your hunt. So hunt zone is just a, a base feature that we've had for a number of years, and it's really a go-to feature. That kind of helps you pick the exact stand. You know, what we what we need to, 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 to kind of drill down a little further at, though, is, is, you know, what else can we provide hunters tool set wise that will allow them to know when during the season to hunt and even when during a given week to hunt. And that's where the impetus of two of the new six features in Pro Whitetail came from initially. So I was first asked, you know, we have these weekly meetings of, among the hunt stand team, all avid hunters, and we always talk about what, what do hunters need or what could we provide hunters that would help their, their time of field, make it, make it more efficient and then more successful. And one of the first things we, we came up with was, Believe it or not, you know, until we did it, uh, no one had ever mapped the entire rut, whitetail rut range in the United States. Uh, you know, certainly some states have it, some regions have it, but no one had ever drilled down and tried to truly map the entire whitetails range in the United States to the two-week peak conception window. Not what some moon phase calendar tells you or whatever, but what data and science has consistently shown state by state, county by county. So that was the first project I tackled. So I had to get in touch with 43 state wildlife agencies um, in the core whitetails range in the lower 48 and get their data sets. And, uh, and they were in all kinds of different forms and quality, to be quite frank. Uh, a lot of the southern states that have very highly variable ruts, uh, you know, a lot of hunters realize that the rut in the south all over the map, uh, they had really good data uh, by and large. Uh, as I moved kind of throughout the rest of the country, the, the data got of, you know, not necessarily of lesser quality, but uh, certainly it became a little harder to come by. 
But so that took months, if you can imagine, to get data for every single county, 4,240 counties and parishes in the United States uh, to get data to that level. Uh, and, in, and in many cases, even to the sub-county level. Uh, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt you. Can you, that flew right past me. What was that number again? How many yeah, counties? 4,240 counties or parishes in the United States that we have rut data to the two week uh, level, or is actually over 5,000 unique deer herds because in many of those counties, the county is, uh, has one or more, sometimes up to three different ruts in a single county. Uh, so much of the deep south is, 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 is highly variable. So we had to come up with rut data for over 5,000 unique deer herds. Uh, that's not an easy task. That's not something you just snap your fingers and, and do. Uh, but it took me months, but luckily most of the state deer program leaders are friends of mine. I've worked with many of them throughout my career. So I was able to you know, strong arm them and get the data uh, and, and standardize it. It came in a number of different forms, but I was able to standardize that data and then give it to our, our expert mapping team to create a color-coded interactive map for hunters. So that's one of the new features is a nationwide rut map that they can literally zoom in right to where they hunt and see a two-week peak uh, breeding window. But not just that, we went ahead and broke out the entire rutting period. So we have a pre-rut period, a peak rut period, what we call the waning rut, which is kind of the latter stages after the peak of the rut. And then even into that uh, second rut period and so on. So we have literally broke down the deer season into the, the various breeding components for every whitetail herd in in 98% of the whitetails range, at least in the U.S. So that's a yeah, and, and and you know, so I'm going to interrupt you. So maybe this will make more sense to people if I explain this. I've got this layer called up right now on my hunt stand, okay? And here where I'm at in Pennsylvania and pretty much everywhere throughout the northeastern part of our country into the, the whole Midwest, it's all blue, different shades of blue. That's not too hot, right, Brian, right now? Well, it, it, that's not the color. The color coded is is just when when the rut actually occurs. Uh, so we've used blue as a standard color throughout much of the Midwest where your, your deer herd is pretty consistent. If you kind of roughly draw a line from say Oklahoma to North Carolina, uh, everything north of that line pretty much has an October or November, what I would call a traditional rut. Uh, south of that line, you'll see a lot of new colors. Uh, if you you know move your app down into say Alabama. I got you, yes, I can. So I see, you're right. So almost the entire Northern two thirds of the whitetail range is some shade of blue. And as you move on down into Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, you see some reds and oranges over into Georgia. You got some purples. Then you get down into Florida and you got a little mix of almost everything there in Florida. Yeah. So, so, you know, the kind of some of the high level figures here that I think will be pretty interesting to hunters is, you know, if we look at those 4,240 counties or parishes, uh, we actually see a 210 day difference in the beginning of the earliest rut and in the beginning of the latest rut just in the United States. So we have a seven month gap between the earliest rut and latest rut in the United States alone. Hunters can hunt the rut for 210 days uh, somewhere in the United States. And in fact, even kind of more gee whiz, the ruts actually extend across nine different calendar months. So you can start hunting a rut in the in the month of July and and end at the beginning of March somewhere in the United States. And are there are there hunting seasons open in all of those months? In most cases, yes. Uh, there is certainly on the July the front end down in Florida, and Florida holds the distinction of having the greatest variation of any single state. Uh, Florida has a, a rut in seven or eight different calendar months. Uh, it's the only state in which you could you know legally probably take you some a few different years to get enough tags but you could legally take you know a buck in seven or eight different calendar months in the state of Florida from July to late February anyway so pretty 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 in, incredible sort of variation we see across the whitetails range that yeah, many and didn't realize and, and again just to jump in right so if i zoom in i'm down in florida just looking at the different colors okay lee county florida and you're telling me here in the app that the peak peak rut dates in Lee County, Florida are from July 22nd to August 5th. And then if I just go north a short distance, 
I'm up in Manatee County. And there you're saying it's from September 30th to the 14th of October, which is tomorrow. So the peak rut, the peak rut's just tailing off in Manatee County. But then if I go up uh, to a different part of Manatee County, nor a little further north, there it's from 1028 to 1111. And then up just to the north of that in Polk County from 1111 to 1125. And if I go jump up closer to uh, Orlando here, just west of Orlando, here in uh, Lake County, it's saying it's in February, February 17th to March 3rd. So like you said, this is unbelievably granular data. And it's amazing to see, you know, I know Florida, like you said, and it's anomaly. Most most states aren't going to have that kind of variation, but this is crazy. Yeah, no, it was a lot of fun to put together. And of course, you know, as a as a longtime deer biologist, I, there was a lot of variation. However, it even shocked me to the to the level of variation that we we discovered. And so this is great information for any hunter anywhere who just wants to know what's going on with their deer herd, because obviously we all want to hunt around the rut when we can, um, either the pre-rut or peak of the rut. And knowing when that time is, is is essential. And it can, like you just pointed out, it can change across half a county, let alone a state or a region. So that project was was super fun, uh, super you know, ex- exhaustive at times to get through it all and crunch all the data. But it's a it's a unique data set that no one else has ever created. Uh, so it's a, it's a one and only opportunity for hunters to really quickly parse through that uh, that information. And, and it's great not only knowing where they when to hunt their local area, but if they're prospecting new states or new areas, you know, hey, if I'm thinking about hunting Texas or I want to hunt a late rut in Alabama or Mississippi allows them to to know where and when to go to be most successful. So that was that was kind of the first project. And that was really core and critical to the development of the second uh, offering. Well, and, 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 and before we move on to the second, I want to ask you another question about this, because, you know, in the deer hunting community, everyone's a skeptic, right? Because there's been a lot of scams and fads and crazy ideas that have been thrown at us over the years, you know? And we could, you know, I'm sure you could think of a couple, I could think of a crazy, I'm thinking of a crazy deer call that somebody tried to introduce a few years ago. It never took off. And I was like, man, that's that's pretty off the wall. And you could think of a product or two that you've seen over the years. What is behind this? Because, you know, people are going to look at this and be like, how can this guy know? How can Hunt Stand know that halfway through this county, that the northern half of this county has a different rut date than the southern half of this county? Tell people a little bit about the data that you're getting from the state agencies. And how are these state agencies calculating these peak rut dates? Right. So, so first of all, none of the data did I come up with and put in the app alone. 100% of the data came from state fish and wildlife agencies, and 100% of it was checked and approved by them before we published it. So just understand that that every state wildlife agency, the 43 states at least on the map, all provided that information. Uh, once we standardized it and crunched it and put it in the app, they got a review, a, view, a review opportunity to make sure that we had put it in correctly. So I'll start there. There were a number of different data sources, uh, so they weren't all the same data. The most common and what I would call the gold standard data set for rut information is actually what we call fetal conception data. Uh, and basically what that means is when a, a pregnant doe is harvested and she has one or more fetuses inside her uterus, we can pull those out, we can measure those and determine how many days old that particular fetus was at the time the doe was killed, and then simply subtract that and we can determine very precisely the doe the day um, got pregnant or conceived. So fetal data is is the gold standard. It's it's very accurate, very reliable. Uh, The next, and and most of the South that had the highly variable ruts used fetal data exclusively. So most of all that variation, all those lines through counties and all that came from very precise data collections where they collected a lot of pregnant does, they measured those fetuses, they determined peak conception and plotted the rut. Uh, And and I wanna make sure that the, the, the listeners understand that when I'm talking about this being a rut map and the peak two week rut, I'm talking about peak two weeks of conception, does getting pregnant. Um, it doesn't always line up with buck movement activity and chasing and all that. Sometimes that actually is heavier on the front end before the peak breeding actually occurs. So make sure we understand what we're talking about here. Uh, so fetal data was used wherever it was possible. If not, 
um, there's also a, a, a strong correlation between adult buck harvest and peak of conception. Um, in other words, most states have a telecheck system of some sort where hunters are required to you know, report their deer. Many of them have some mecha mechanism to determine if that was a year and a half old or older deer. Uh, often don't st separate them any, any more granularly than that. But then if we look at adult buck harvest, it actually follows a nice little bell-shaped curve that over overlaps nicely with the peak of, of, of the rut. So we were able to use buck harvest in some states. Uh, a third data set was actually deer car collisions, which is a little less precise, but still a useful one. Multiple research, peer-reviewed research studies have shown that more deer get hit during the peak of the rut than any other time of the year. Not surprising, deer are on their feet, they're chasing, doing stupid things. So we can use uh, car collision data to some extent as well. And then finally, just in a couple of states, we had to just pretty much go with the, the, the anecdotal knowledge of the state fish and game agency. Based on decades of their folks in the field, biologists, taxidermists, we know that our rut is about November 3rd to November 17th or whatever the, you know, whatever the, and, and most of that, and there was only a handful of states and most of those were in the, I would say the Midwest where the rut is very consistent in those first couple of weeks in November. It wasn't a state that had a lot of variation. Uh, so that's that's the various data sources that we we obtained, and uh, were able to, to to put into the app and and, uh, and 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 thankfully you know once we mapped it all out it kind of made sense not that that was a goal but it kind of, kind of looked right to a deer biologist's eye if you will with one exception and there was one really interesting uh, kind of anomaly that we found that we thought it was an error in the data at first where we looked at the uh, border between Alabama and Georgia so we're talking about. Western Georgia and Eastern Alabama, where those two state lines hit, there's about a two month difference between peak rut dates just at a state line. You think, how in the world can deer herds just across an imaginary line in the sand be two months different in rut dates? Yeah, yeah. And I'm looking at it here. So I'm just going to yeah. throw this out because I know you don't have it right in front of you, Brian. Yeah. So I'm looking at, okay, I'm in Western Georgia here, yeah. Heard County, Georgia, 11 6 to 11 20. And then you jump right across the straight state line in Randolph County, uh, Alabama, 1225 to 1-8. So you're looking from early November in Georgia, you go right across the straight line, and you're, you're talking about something from Christmas into early January. Right. And so when I first saw that, I thought, that can't be right. So actually what I did is I convened a, a, a meeting, a conference with the two deer biologists from both Alabama and Georgia. Said, all right, we got to get this straight, guys. You know, there's a what appears to be some somebody's wrong on some side of the border here. What? How can we make sense of this? And we we went through both of their data sets, at, in you know, at infinitum, and and then we started talking about where those deer came from, back in the restocking days, and lo and behold, that was the explanation. Both their data sets were were good, uh, but when we looked at where uh, Alabama got its deer from to restock those eastern counties, came from the deep south part of, of Alabama that had a historical late December, early January rut period. So they moved late rutting deer to that part of the state. Uh, on the other side of the border in Georgia, they went to the coastal areas back in the restocking days and pulled deer herds that, that rutted in late October, early November historically. And so it's where those states obtained those deer to restock those counties that explain the variation. So there is in fact, six weeks to eight weeks variation on either side of a state line. I'm sure there's some blending somewhere in there, but at this point, even 50 to 70 years later, those deer herds are still operating like they were when those original deer were, were moved there, which is pretty interesting. It uh, is. And, and, you know, it's not, you know, there's some variation, like you say, there's some blending and some variation. If you wanted to look at, you know, a, a state line where there's much, much more correlation, but still not exactly the same. You know, I'm heading out to Southeast Kansas around Halloween and I'll be out there to hunt the rut. And I was looking at the counties that I hunt in Kansas and it's saying, you know, basically 1031 to 1114. And then when you just go right across the line in my, uh, Missouri, it's saying, you know, uh, we're, we're 11 4 to 11 18. So you got a four day difference. Well, four day difference isn't very much. And we both know that there are other things. Okay, temperatures, precipitation, 
you know, wind. There's all sorts of things that can vary what you're going to see from day to day in a given hunting area. And but the point is, those two states are basically saying their rut is all in the same ballpark. And so this isn't meant to be like, well, you know, the hunt stand said it, and I, I went on this trip, and I can't believe I didn't see unbelievable rut action that day. It's it's a guide to help you narrow it down to a given time frame, and then within that time frame, and I think this is where we jump in to sort of phase two, because, you know, this map gives you some incredible data and a tool, like you say, something that's unprecedented in terms of its breadth, from literally from coast to coast, from, from Washington State to, to, to Florida, from, from Seattle Seattle to Miami and everywhere in between that whitetails can be hunted. You know, you've got this data. So now you have an idea. Okay. This is probably when I would want to do my trip to that area. Or if you're local, this is when I'm going to focus my efforts. But beyond that, now phase two is where I can look at day to day of what day is Tuesday going to be better than Friday or is Thursday going to be better than Monday? You know, that, that's, that's exactly right. I want to make one final point on the rut map. A lot of hunters uh, mistakenly believe that the actual peak of the rut changes year to year a lot, say several weeks in some cases. They believe that. Um, however, based on, I'm talking about hundreds, if not thousands of studies on whitetail breeding, literally once a deer herd's breeding dates are set for a given area, they just don't change more than literally a couple of days. And so, you know, a lot of hunters that I've talked to share this information about the rut map with are like, well, that's that's good for one year, but does it change the next year? No, it doesn't really change. I mean, literally, we see about two to three days variation in peak breeding. Now, I'm not saying what bucks are doing, chasing or, or not chasing. I'm talking about when does get bred. That's what the, this, this map shows you. And that does not change a lot year to year. So development of the rut map was absolutely instrumental in development of the whitetail activity forecast tool, which was the next uh, the next uh, feature we were going to talk about in the new Pro Whitetail upgrade. And, and the reason that was so important is because all the other deer movement models that have been attempted that I've, and I've picked them all apart, I've looked at everybody's deer movement models out there on the market, and most of them are, are frankly a joke, but I won't go quite that far on all of them, but most of them are based on a one or two weather variables applied to all deer herds everywhere. But hey, let's face it. You know, we've identified over 5,000 unique deer herds with, with the rut map. And, and when a deer herd, once we understand an individual uh, deer herd's breeding chronology, in other words, when it goes through the pre-rut, the rut, the post-rut, all those different phases, that absolutely fundamentally affects their movement. You can't create a deer movement tool unless you understand the individual breeding behavior and chronology for each deer herd. So... Once we developed this rut map, we had the underpinning, the most important underpinning for the deer movement forecasting tool because that was the big missing link. Uh, you know, a lot of people can plug in different weather variables and weight them accordingly and try to figure out what might or might not move deer, but nothing moves deer more than the breeding period, <laughs> regardless of weather, regardless of moon. Uh, if it's rut time, it's rut time. You know, you may have slightly increased or decreased activity based on weather patterns and things, but there's still going to be activity. So once we got the rut map done, we were able to then uh, create uh, what I consider an absolutely revolutionary new whitetail forecasting tool. And the way it works is very simple. The back end is very complex, but the way it works is very simple in that it works just like a seven-day weather forecast. So it allows you to look forward in the future seven days, and it tells you which of those days of the week, it's, it scores them. It gives you a score, from one to 100, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute. It gives you a percentage value for each day of the, of, of the week, and it gives you a peak time of day or morning, um, you know, morning or evening, or midday if it happened to be. Uh, so it gives you a peak time and a score. So what that means to the hunters, then they can look forward up to a week and say, all right, you know, on Thursday of this coming week, you know, I've got a much higher... Uh, movement score than I do any other day of the week, and I've got one day to hunt. I want to focus my, my my time then, so it allows them to to hunt with some degree of confidence. Now, the way I built this was incredibly complex. Um, luckily, we have a PhD mathematician on our team at Hunt Stand because I'm a biologist. I can come up with all the science about what drives deer and what doesn't, and how to do all that. But when it comes to creating an algorithm that literally has tens of thousands of data combinations, this I want to just stress that for a minute. 
if you think you can sit there and, and, and do about 10,000 data combinations of weather and time and date and breeding chronology and all those things, then I'm, I'm, you're, you're, you're smarter than I am. Um, so we took months of, of you know, pouring through the research uh, on deer movements, radio telemetry data, all that type thing. And I created a, this, you know, all the variables that we want to put in the model. And then luckily, again, we have a PhD mathematician on our team that I can then teach how to put that into a model that he can build that does this. So, so what, I, what I set out to do is to make it kind of under, easy to understand for the average hunter. So I, I, I started with 100% being an absolute perfect day for whitetail deer, and it, just like acing a, a test back in high school. You know, if you got 100, man, you smoked it, right? But that rarely happens, right? You're always going to miss one or two. Well, the way I built the model is that, you know, of all the possible variables that we know that affect deer movement, if every single one of them was perfect. The time of day was perfect. Time of the rut was perfect. You have, you know, a rising barometer. You have seasonally cool temperatures, light wind speeds. I mean, if I could create the perfect day to hunt, that would give you 100% value. Most of the scores aren't going to be that high, of course particularly during the non-rutting time of the year. Uh, but so it, if, for example, a hunter looked forward in the week and it gave a 72% score as the highest day on Thursday, you got a 72% movement score. That means of, of the perfect, all the perfect conditions in the world, 72% of them are in your favor. Uh, that's good. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good number. Uh, if you start getting in the 80s and 90s, man, you're, you need to have your butt in a tree. Uh, because everything is really lining up for you with time of the, the breeding season, the weather conditions, everything is is really aligning well for for you. Uh, one thing important to keep in mind is that this draws on on, on eleven different satellite uh, or or internal uh, uh, sort of databases. Every time a hunter clicks that little icon on our phone, eleven different data sources are pulled for every single one of those. At, at 5,000 different count, you know, deer herd levels. I mean, so it goes to that same granular level that our rut map does. So if you're hunting, if you and I are hunting the same county in Florida, but uh, I'm hunting an earlier rut than you, I'm going to have a different score than you just across half a county because the deer herd's doing something different there. Um, so it, it, it combines weather with all this rut data and all these other things to come up with these kinds of variables. And it changes in real time, just like a real weather forecast. So if you pull your report for the week and, and it looks like Thursday is going to be the best day, don't just put your app away and forget about it. Check it every day because it, if the weather conditions are changing, so too will the scores. Now, uh, this is a real-time, living, breathing, precise model. So, yeah, and, and, and to that end, again, I've got it here, right? So yep. if you click on your, your whitetail forecast, it's going to call up a screen where you can scroll through basically the next seven days and it's going to tell you uh, your weather for each day, just generally sort of a, a weather forecast, the, the peak movement time for that day. So like uh, here in Pennsylvania, you're basically saying, um, you know, 6 p.m. for Friday, 10 a.m., 8 a.m., 6 p.m., 8 a.m. So basically probably a lot of days it's whether it's a morning or evening hunt is going to be better. But what's really interesting, and this is where I think it gets into all that data that you're referring to, Brian, where you guys are pulling in um, local weather data from across the country. If you go down to the bottom of the screen and swipe up, it calls up these charts. And there you can actually use your finger and you can scroll left and right and you can see each day and where the peak times are. And below that activity score, which is basically your top line, that's the aggregation of all your data. And then below that, you can see the kind of data that you guys are including in your calculation, right? So your next line gives me temperature and dew point. And it's actually comparing the forecasted temperatures to what the average temperatures are, right? So you're yes. calculating whether that day is going to be cooler or warmer than an average October the 14th. Then you yes. go down to the next line and you're looking at wind speed and direction and barometric pressure. So you're pulling those data in. And then you go down to the third uh, column down below the, the, the top line. There you're looking at uh, humidity, precipitation, and cloud cover. So the three more pieces of data. Now, are these 
all of the data pieces that are going in or these are just what you're choosing to show the user? Yeah, yeah that's just what we're, we're using to show the user. There's actually a couple more beyond that. Uh, there are, are almost 15 different variables in total that we're using uh, simultaneously. Uh, and, and like you said, it's, it's complex in that we're not just putting what a temperature does, it's high or low. We're saying, how does that compare to yesterday? How does that compare to a seasonal average? How much has it moved in the last 24 hour period? I mean, this thing goes on and on and on. It's, it's, it's pages and pages of if, the, if this, then that, uh, with weather that, um, like I said, it was a, a deep dive, uh, but it was a heck of a lot of fun. And, 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 and thankfully we've had a, a handful of very avid knowledgeable hunters using it over the last few weeks, kind of in a beta test fashion. And it has been incredible, thankfully, knock on wood, it has been incredibly spot on. I mean, literally within minutes for most of these hunters, the peak movement times have proven to be uh, accurate. So, uh, and we have, you know, further in intentions of, of even refining it. Uh, there are a few things that we think we can even tighten up. Uh, and the good thing is, is that, you know, with 2 million active users of HuntStand now, which is our audience, which is incredible, uh, we have many of them voluntarily putting in harvest and observation data, which we're not going to look at your individual thing because, you know, we don't care, but we do aggregate, we can aggregate that information and plug it back in against the model and say, are hunters seeing the most deer during periods that we say they should be seen? Are they harvesting more deer during periods we say they should be harvesting more deer? We can actually use this to actually better fit the model and even get it more precise over time. So, so we think it's well, dangerous now, but it's going to get even better. Well, that's really interesting because basically what you're talking about is, you know, this whole hunt stand app, right? The entire ecosystem, it's a closed loop because on the one hand, you have all the research and the data and the science and the real time weather information that you're able to draw in from the outside. And then you have all the individual data that your users are putting in, you know, what are they actually seeing and harvesting on their individual hunts and and the locations of those and then like you say not that you're not that you're you know trying to find out where my honey hole is but it's aggregating that entire set and looking at the trends and then matching that up with the data and seeing you know whether it's it's confirming or it's indicating that you know there's something that isn't adding up now one thing i have to ask you about and this is a big debate in the deer hunting community and i don't see it and the reason i ask is i don't see it here listed anywhere you have nothing in here about moon and i know that there's a big debate and and there are people who are very much believers in the moon there are a lot of people who say there's been a lot of studies done and there's no data to indicate. So I'll just ask you, you know, is moon data factored into any of this? And, you know, if so, if, if not, why? Uh, the answer is yes. Moon phase is considered in that. And there is a weight for various phases of the moon. However, I'll be honest that it's a very nominal value because the data simply don't support giving it a significant weight. Uh, if it did, I would put it in there, but I had to be honest, rigorously honest as a biologist to look at the data, and the data don't clearly show any direct relationship, certainly to deer breeding. Uh, there's really two, two windows or, or two questions when it comes to the moon. Does moon affect when does come into cycle and into asterisk and breed? And the answer is no. We can unequivocally say we've got studies from New Brunswick, Canada to South Texas and everywhere in between decades of research, there's zero correlation between when a doe cycles and moon phase. We can put that one to bed. However, when it comes to general deer movements and moon phase, data are not as clear. Uh, you know, outside of doe cycles. Well, the, the, the other thing is, Brian, too, and I want to throw this out and then I'll let you respond. There's really two things that come into play regarding moon as well as one is moon phase, you know, is it a full moon, a new moon, a waxing, a waning, which is one thing. The other thing is moon position, because every day, whether it's a new moon or a full moon or anywhere in between, you know, whether you can see that moon or not, it's orbiting the earth. And so it's there's twice a day that it's going to be overhead and, and, and twice a day that it's going to be on the horizon. And so there are some people who pay attention to moon phase. There are other people who pay attention to moon position, and they're not the same thing. And I'm wondering, you know, how much you've looked at those two different ways of evaluating the moon's potential impact on deer movement. Yeah, we, we looked at all the studies, or I, I personally looked at all the studies 
that I would consider real studies. I mean, scientifically based stuff where they had GPS collars on deer and correlated that to moon phase and so forth. Most of them did only only got to the to the level of granularity of moon phase. They didn't get into kind of where it was in terms of aspect on the horizons. Uh, so so I, I went with that, and there was a slight a slight trend in moon position, but ever so slight. Certainly not near as big as temperature, uh, time of the breeding season. There were cer certain variables, barometric pressure. There was two or three that really do drive deer movements. We can say reliably, and moon phase was just not one of them that, that by itself. However, it was important, I think, for us to at least include it, uh, give it some value, because again, based on the, the research, there may be a slight value there, but it's not going to drive uh, the, the, the equation because the data just aren't sufficient to support that. Sure. Now let's talk about the other things. Obviously, you've you give this score for each day. And so the idea is that, you know, the average deer hunter like me. I don't have to think about all these 15 different parts of the data. I can just look at that top line score and say, you know, today's an 85%, tomorrow's a 60%. I think I'll hunt today and not tomorrow. But that being said, what are some of the biggest influencers? You know, you mentioned barometric pressure, you mentioned weather. Because uh, again, you know, as we all know, I mean, we've been there, I have hunted you know, great states like Illinois and Kansas and Missouri at times that are supposed to be great. That doesn't mean you're going to just see deer running around like bunnies chasing each other everywhere all day. Uh, so there are definitely other things that are going to impact your hunt. Right. Well, let me, let me start with the even a bigger, bigger picture sort of statement here. Based on everything we think we know about what drives deer movements, all the research and data. And I, and I can also share that I spoke and collaborated with many of the top deer minds of our time on this project. So this is not a Brian Murphy solo sort of thought process. I, you know, I could drop names, but it's all the big deer names that folks would know about. I spoke with almost all of them and they all agreed that the, the thought process, the logic framework, if you will, that I, that I used was the most appropriate. We also all agreed kind of anecdotally that, the best models in the world will probably only predict about 70% of what drives deer movements. In other words, there's about 30% of variation that we'll never be able to know. You know, was it a coyote bumped a deer out of its bed and got him on his feet? Is there, you know, there's so many just random things and individual deer behavior that just get up. Well, sure. Them. Just, just even pressure from other so, hunters in the year. Yeah. So, so, so we think that we're, we're as close to the Holy grail of around 70 to 75% of explaining what drives deer to move or not to move. So that's, that's kind of the first statement. You know, what, what drives the, you know, one of the, the key underpinnings of what drives the model are, are time and day, which don't sound overly complicated. But again, if we can graph each individual deer herd's activity patterns around the breeding season for 5,000 deer herds, you know, every deer herd that has a different rut date in a different area, we can then kind of plot what we know is a ramping up of activity during the pre-rut, peaking during the, the, the rut itself, a little bit of a slowdown during that sort of waning rut, maybe a little bump during the second rut. So we can start to, to, to logically apply a value to each deer herd just based on the, the, where they are, where that deer herd is during the breeding season. Then we look at the data on time of day. And, and there's pretty clear data here um, that early in the, in the, I'll call it the bow season or pre, before the pre-rut period, kind of in that lull before it all gets started, we're mostly on an activity pattern around food sources, more evening activity generally than morning activity. As we move into the pre-rut and the rut, we see more balanced morning and evening activity. As we shift from the peak rut into the waning rut and into the second rut, and ultimately to the end of the season, we see a slow shift back more towards evening patterns on food sources. So there's a, a time variation variable in there as well. So I had to then put, I had to assign both a, a day value and a time value for every deer herd in the country. Then we applied all these weather and, and other environmental variables barometric pressure, temperature, wind speed, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then put those, layer those on top to drive the model even, even in a more precise fashion. So like I said, it was a, it was a big lift, a big undertaking. But uh, one thing you said there, I want to uh, emphasize, I, I did emphasize the fact that hunters need to check this daily because as what, particularly during periods of unsettled weather, because the, 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 you know, the model's changing every day as weather changes, right? So, so check it regularly. Don't just look three days ahead and call it a day and, and then realize on Thursday when you got there that actually the weather had changed and it wasn't as good a day. 
The other thing is, look at the, don't just look at the day of the week that has the top score. Let's say, for example, I was hunting the pre rut here in Georgia, and, I, and my top day of the seven day forecast was 84%. That's a good, strong value. I need to be in the deer stand when, when, when the model's in the 80s. But if I looked at the other days of the week and they're all around 80, 81, 82, I need to be in the woods every one of those days. Um, you know, in other words, you know, don't just look at the single day of the week that has the greatest period and kind of forget about the rest of the week. If all the days in that week are high in their score, then consider hunting as often as you can all of those days. And the same is true, let's say you're hunting at the very front end of both season, it's stinking hot, and the, and the highest value on, 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 uh, on our uh, forecast is, you know, 59%. That means it's almost a 50-50 bet. You almost have as many things working against you as for you. You know, yeah, 59% on Thursday may be your best day, but if the rest of the days are all in the 50s too, maybe a better week just to kind of stay home and stay out of your favorite hunting areas, frankly. Uh, doesn't mean you won't kill a deer on a, on a day with a low score. It just means you've got a lot more things working against you than for you. Uh, yeah, so. well, and, and I've always, and I, I shouldn't say always, in recent years, I've become very, very convinced of this. I've written a couple articles about it, and um, it's true, and it ties right in with what you've created here. It's counterintuitive, but what I've learned through many years of experience and a lot of unproductive hunting, and then a lot of being blessed to be able to travel to really good deer states at the really good times, is you will be a more successful deer hunter if, you, again, I'm, I'm defining success here in harvests, if you just enjoy spending time in the woods and you have the time to do that, then by all means hunt every day. But but you will be a more successful deer hunter if you hunt less. It's not about hours in the tree. It's about the right hours on the right days in the right places. And you'll kill a lot more big bucks if you hunt where there are more big bucks on the days that those big bucks are more prone to move under the conditions that are more prone to prompt those bucks to move. And it's as simple as that. And that's what your whitetail forecast is all about. Well, yeah, the three tools that we've already talked about work together seamlessly. So the first thing you want to do is identify, generally speaking, the best time to hunt. The rut map can help you determine what stages of the rut you're likely hunting, where you're going to be, and therefore your strategies. Then you say, all right, all right I'm going to pick that two-week period. Then you start looking at the forecast and say, what days specifically are going to give me the best odds? Then, then you can narrow it down to times and days to, to you hunt more in the mornings, more in the evenings, or what have you on what days. And then you use the hunt zone help you to pick the right tree, make sure the wind is blowing in the right way, direction for the area you want to hunt. So you use all these tools together to, to maximize your, your opportunities. Uh, and that's what we've set out to do is just create a suite of things that can be used as a by themselves or certainly in conjunction is better so that, again, you can really, oh, drill, yeah. you know. Well, and to your point, you know, we've obviously spent our conversation today talking about these new things that you guys have added. But again, you know, you guys have a tab uh, just for weather, completely independent of your deer forecast. And your so lunar tables are in here. And you can do offline mapping. So if you're going to somewhere without service, you can download maps. You can uh, record your harvests, your all your game sightings. You can help manage your trail cameras with the app. You can make to-do lists. You can actually share locations with your hunting partners so you can see where everybody is in the field. Uh, you have all different kinds of maps, including property information, public lands, um, you know, 2D, 3D, uh, monthly satellite updates. I mean, there's really a ton that's in hunt stand that's beyond anything that we discussed today. Although I think that what we discussed today is obviously new and very exciting. And to that end, you know, uh, Brian's a great guy and he wants to help his fellow deer hunters. And he spent, you know, a year plus working on all this. Um, as much as he'd like to give it to you, you're not just giving it to everyone, right? There is a subscription for this. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, the hunt stand programmers and teams and all the satellites we rent to provide all this stuff doesn't come free. But thankfully, you know, even the pro whitetail tier upgrade is a whopping $69.99 a year. So in other words, to get every single feature hunt stand offers, the most you can spend is 70 bucks. If you're an existing hunt stand pro user already, I mean, you're paying $30 a year for our, you know, our, our current package. 
whatever balance you have left on that subscription can be applied to your $69.99 purchase. So you can actually just apply that and upgrade. And if you're a free tier user, obviously you haven't spent any money yet, or if you're not a customer at all, then it would be $69.99 if you wanted to jump all the way up to the Pro Whitetail package, which includes the two features that we've talked a lot about, but there are actually four other new features. I'll just give a kind of a quick, uh, you know, 30 second overview of, of those. One is also a, a new Whitetail habitat layer. So this is a GIS map layer that you can uh, apply across anywhere in the United States and see the inherent vegetative components in a color heat sinked fashion. So the darker the color, the more uh, uh, attractive those habitat features would be to white-tailed deer. So if you're kind of power scouting, not super precise at the 100 acre level, but if you're looking at blocks of public land, particularly planning to hunt out west, and you wanna see where the inherent habitat features are best for deer, you can quickly determine that. So that's the new whitetail habitat layer. Uh, another one that's quite useful, particularly for hunters in the Midwest, is a crop history layer. So hunters can look at, at uh, all the crops planted around any location they want to look at and see up to 134 different planting types, corn, soybeans, alfalfa, wheat, oats, whatever it may be, uh, 134 different choices. Uh, and so you can actually see what's going on around you from an agricultural perspective, which can be quite useful, not only knowing where to hunt, if, if you're hunting next to you know, fill, uh, a, a farm that's left some beans or corn out, or in, in identifying what you need to plant. You know, if you're in the Midwest and you're surrounded by beans and corn, you know, what you may need to plant habitat-wise, food plot-wise, would be cool season attractive stuff to draw those deer away from those summer sources. So it allows you to kind of customize your habitat. Uh, yet another layer is the monthly satellite layer. And this uh, is a first, and we're the only current app on the market uh, that's a non-governmental three-letter agency that has monthly satellite imagery. Uh, the provider we use actually provides military-grade uh, intelligence to, uh, to, to our government uh, because it does provide such recency. Uh, up to th you know, 30 days, you can actually see what's going on on a property, a clear cut, a burn, a flood, whatever it may be. And that can be quite helpful. Um, you know, if you really want to see what's happening on your property or around you, uh, and unfortunately, most of the satellite providers that other apps use, Google Maps or Mapbox, those images can be two or three years old. Um, or, you know, so it's a lot of hunters don't realize it, that many of the images we're looking at on our phones are very uh, out of date. And uh, finally, uh, we also have partnered with uh, USDA Farm Services Agency to get a new map layer, a new satellite layer, if you will. Uh, that is incredibly rich. It's the richest, most detailed layer I've ever seen. Uh, for the vast majority of properties I've looked at, there is, I've never seen a, a, an aerial image so crisp and clear that, I mean, you can drill down and see deer trails. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, so that's a new, a, a new layer that you can also view a property. Is there a name for, is there a name for that layer? We, we just call it the National Aerial, aerial Imagery Layer. Um, and so it's just another, we, you know, we, we have, four different satellite layers available in our app now with the addition of these two new ones. So you can look at a Google image, you can look at a map box image, you can look at this farms, this national aerial imagery layer, you can look at the monthly layer. So you can just toggle between all these different satellite views to see which one provides you whatever information you're looking for. Uh, so that's the, the key thing is, you know, you can just bounce around these, these, these different features in the app. And as you mentioned, you know, the, the amount of tools we have, you can measure food plots, you can share hunting properties, you can run your trail camera data, you can you know, log your harvest, your observation data. I mean, this thing is like a smartphone on steroids, this app, it, you just take it as far as you wanna go because there is some depth in every nook and cranny that's pretty incredible. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as you were talking, you know, really what you can do with HuntStand is limited only by your imagination and to how, how far you wanna, use that information and apply it. So, um, well, I'll give you, you I'll know. give you one, I'll give you one quick humorous one that, uh, makes us laugh around the shop. So the, uh, probably the most active hunt stand customer we have, uh, lives in Tennessee. And, uh, you know, we started seeing so many pins getting dropped and properties getting saved. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. We're like, what in the world does this, this person do? You know, I mean, he's, he's dropped thousands of markers. We found out he was actually in the septic uh, tank cleaning business, and he was marking every single uh, customer of his, creating a hunt stand map around their, their parcel and dropping a pin on their septic tank and color coding them to uh, determine whether he had already cleaned them or when they needed to be serviced next. 
So, uh, so yeah, there's some innovative uses of hunt stand that um, we find. You can, you can keep right. track of a lot of crap with hunt stand, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and kind of a final take home here, you know, even at um, $69.99 for Pro Whitetail, that is still less than all of our competitors have for their standard tiers. And their standard tiers don't offer literally 50% of the functionality that hunt stand does and particularly with the whitetail specific stuff that we now have i mean no one has anything like the whitetail stuff that we have i mean it's just we're and and the beauty of it is is you know i've already got some new ideas for new things that uh we're going to be adding to the to the pro whitetail tier uh in the not too distant future that are even even more mind-boggling well unfortunately brian in today's economy 70 dollars just isn't a whole lot anymore and you're not going to get two packs of broadheads at your local you know, shields or farm fleet or whatever for, for that. Um, so unfortunately, you know, that's, that's the way of the world and uh, not a really big investment. If you think about it in a tool that can not only help you, you know, every single day throughout the season, but then your entire off season, whether you're planting food plots, moving stands, uh, scouting new properties, whether that's finding public land, uh, identifying landowners to secure access, you know, for new leases or permissions, um, just a lot there. And I think we've covered it really well. So I can tell you this, Brian, um, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not trying to hide it, right? You guys comp me a subscription, at least for this year. So I'm going to, I'm going to be using this and I am going to be you know, paying close attention to how accurate your forecasts are. And selfishly, I'm hoping that you're right on the money because I'll probably be choosing at least some of the days that I spend outside based on, on this information. And hopefully, you know, your hard work pays off for me and helps me fill the freezer and put some, you know, antler on the wall. And, uh, you know, we'll come back next year. Like you said, you have some more new stuff. We'll talk about that, but I appreciate your time today. It was a very interesting uh, conversation and I'm, I'm definitely uh, impressed with the amount of thought and, and organization and just sheer volume of data that you've put behind this product. Labor of love for me and as a deer biologist, it's a kind of a dream come true to help create tools for deer hunters. I mean, I'm first and foremost a deer hunter, have been my entire life, never done anything but work with whitetail deer. So this is a, a perfect, uh, you know, marriage for me too. And, and frankly, it's taught me and I'm, I'm using it, even though I built the darn product, I'm using them every day because I can't crunch that many pieces of data myself. And, and come up with it. Why, why would I? I got to, I, I built something for that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, people to use it and to test it and give us feedback. And it's not going to be perfect. No, no, no tool ever is perfect, but I, I'm confident enough that you'll be happy with it. We'll be talking a year from now going, yeah, I use it as often as I use the hunt zone to pick which, you know, which stand to hunt from a wind perspective. I think you'll use it that frequently. And I, I know I will be. Well, good, man. Well, so for everyone, if you, like I said at the beginning, you know, if you haven't ever tried Hunt Stand, you know, it's not hard to find. Just go to your app store and search Hunt Stand. It's going to come right up. Uh, download that baby. Uh, give it a go. Play around with some of those free tools. And, uh, you know, I know what's going to happen, Brian. The guys are going to be sitting out there. You're going to be wondering. They'll be like, I just can't take it anymore, man. They're going to they're going to drop that 70 bucks. And they want to know, you know, is tomorrow a 65 or an 85? I got to know. Only way to find out. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, thanks again. Best of luck to you this season, okay? Same to you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for downloading the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Pick up the latest issue of Peterson's Bow Hunting Magazine on your local newsstand or connect with us online at bowhuntingmag.com. <laughs>